So thank you everybody for taking some time out of your day to come back and, and join us to talk about the, the wonderful world of BIM management. Uh, this is essentially part three in a series we've been doing over a, a fair bit of time. And each one of these presentations has built on the previous a little bit. So talking about all sorts of different things as it relates to BIM management, uh, hopefully little nuggets of something you can take back and you know, put into practice inside your office, put into practice personally. Um, just take some things and look at it as a little bit of a professional development type of role and what other types of things might, might we be able to do to Obviously, if you're here and we're talking about this, some way that you might be able to leverage, imagine it to make your life a little bit better. So as we're looking at this, my name is Joe Eikens here. My role in the company is the director of Imagine It's Building Lifecycle Solutions team, uh, which really essentially comes back to saying is I've got the, the pleasure and enjoy of being able to work with all of our technical team that has anything to do with buildings, so the people that are doing with stuff with design, construction, our facilities management team, um, all of those groups are people that are, are people that I work with. Um, and all of the, that team has different aspects and different ways that as we're working with clients that we need to interact with this whole idea of BIM or managing that BIM environment. And if we go back and think about the the past presentations that we've had on this topic, they, they've gone through and talked about what are some ideas and philosophies behind how do you manage software? How do you manage people? Um, I'm, I'll touch on some of those things again, but I'm not going to go in as deep as I did in some of those past presentations. Uh, there's the, I guess, plug where if you're interested in seeing what was on some of those past presentations of what is out there for BIM management and software management, people management, stuff like that. Beyond the, the recap side that we'll get here, I, go back. Let's, let's take some time and find another hour out of your day, out of your week, and take a gander at some of those past presentations. I, I think they've been good. Uh, they've certainly been well received. As we're going through our time today, we're going to look at some of the basic foundational pieces to make sure that when we're talking about BIM management, that we're starting from the same definition. We'll get through that fairly quickly and then move into how can we go about uh, managing software, managing people, the overview, kind of recapping what we've done in some of the past ones, and then getting and starting to dig a little bit deeper. Where can we make an impact? If we're looking at all these ways that we can go about impacting our software environment, impacting the people that we work with. You know, which people, which software? How do we define where your spheres of influence are, where you can have direct impact, where you're coming through and maybe just having more of a incidental effect on other people? And what's that big old list of stuff that you have no control on or no significant control on? How can we identify those things and based off of that, turn around and understand where are you as presumably a BIM manager or somebody who wants to become that or whatever your role is, where can you best apply your scarce resources, your time, your effort, your energy to provide the best possible impact? How can we go about analyzing what it is that we need to do once we know what those spheres of influence are and how do we measure if it was effective? We, you went through and you said, we're going to do X so that we can make the company better. Well, did it? How do we measure those things? Again, maybe not everything here is going to be something new for you, but hopefully there's those little nuggets, things to think about. If nothing else, there's a little bit of time that we'll have here to, to sit back and think about things again. And there are plenty of times where I'll go in and be a part of a, a workshop or a conference or a lecture or something and it just is good to rehear some of those those foundational things just to recenter myself on what is important. Hopefully we've got a lot more than just that, but there's value in those things as well. So first part is our definition. Uh, this is a table that I honestly I've used in each of the three presentations so far. It's a good, a good way to kind of ground ourselves with the understanding of what is 
a BIM manager. What do we want to consider part of the, the practice of BIM management? That assumes that you're, you're one of the lucky folks that only wears one hat. There aren't many of those lucky folks out there. Most of the time we're looking at stuff and saying, well, I wear a BIM manager hat, but I also do some production work, and I also do, and I also do, and I also do, I also do IT, I also, whatever it is. You're going to wear multiple hats as you're doing different things in your company, no matter what. But as that's happening, which one of those things that you do fits into the concept of what is BIM management? Generally speaking, and this is all coming from uh, that just, UK AEC standards uh, documentation and things that have been out there for a number of years now. But as we're looking at that, what's, what's real? Well, the things that tend to be the BIM manager role are those that are more strategic in nature. We might not always be able to act strategically. Heck, I know in the position I am in right now, uh, I am much more reactive than I'd like to be. That's you know, part of it's just life and, you know, how and where is your business these days and, and things like that. And I have a hard time saying no. That's a problem. I, It's a problem. <laughs> but as I try to get beyond that type of problem, um, it, I need to. You need to so that we can think strategically beyond just what's the fastest way that I can tactically get something accomplished in a Revit file so that my team or I can get on to the next thing. But we need to be able to think a little bit more strategically of how are you leveraging BIM to meet your corporate objectives? One of the things you might have to ask yourself through there is what in the heck are the corporate objectives? There might be a spot where you have to get with senior leadership inside your firm and say, what are our corporate objectives? Is there anything as a corporate objective that we've got beyond make payroll? You know, that, that's a nice objective to have, don't get me wrong, but what is out there? And then as you understand what's the, the vision of the company, how can you leverage the, the tools and the things that are around that, that BIM environment to help reach or you know, help the company realize those goals? It might require some research. It might require some documenting or definition of process and workflow and all the other things that are through here, absolutely. On the tactical end, we need to actually do a bunch of these things once we've identified them, and we'll go into some of those details, but this helps identify from an overall piece what are those types of things that we're looking at when we're talking about BIM management. And certainly as I'm going through the rest of the time that we have together here, we'll be focusing on those items that are uh, more strategic in nature. Not entirely. I mean, sometimes we've got to get tactical, and, and but that's, that's where we're heading to. From that spot then, if we're going into, you know, if these are the types of things that a BIM manager does, we can break a lot of that down into how, as a BIM manager, we can do you know, various activities involved with strategic management and production that are software related and are people related. From an imaginative side, we, we've got a, a common item that we'll call when we're delivering services or consulting with people, we'll say what we need to do is come and find out what solutions are out there that we can recommend to our customers that is the appropriate and best blend of people, process, and technology. Um, and they all fall into this. So if we're looking at it from just the software, the, the technology side for a little bit, there's a few things that we need to pay attention to when it comes to that software management. And as I've mentioned before, understanding what is your firm's core business. If your core business is landscape architecture and you're looking at software and technology, you're probably not gonna spend much time playing around with robot structural analysis. I mean, that's, that's the kind of stupidly obvious type of thing, but it's stupidly obvious to help make the point. You've gotta know what your company is. If you're somebody who has just recently taken on the role of BIM manager, maybe you transitioned to another company. We're seeing a lot of that as people are moving around in this economy from one company, one role to another. Uh, you just got on board with that, that firm to help out with things or you're planning on it or whatever. One of the items that you've got to do is get to understand the culture of that company. What is your comp that company's core business? Hopefully, that's an easy something 
that you could just prattle off at the top of your head. You know what your company is. If that's the case, then we can use that knowledge to start going through the rest of this. You know, staying up to date with software and technology trends. Um, not just taking emails or things that you get from Imagine It or from Autodesk and uh, it's another email junket. And glance at them at least a little bit. See if there's something through there so you can get an idea of what's what's really happening. Staying on staying current, staying top on top of what's happening there. If you're in that Autodesk BIM 360 world, there's regular updates and regular changes and enhancements that are happening to that system. You can't let yourself fall really all that far behind if you're going to be helping to direct your company. As you're evaluating all the different things to see, is this a piece of software that we ought to take on or, or something through there? There's a list of questions. You know, screen cap this, uh, jot these things down. This is your checklist for what types of things do I need to pay attention to as we're looking at taking on a new piece of software or enhancing what we do with an existing piece of software. Are we using all the right things? Is, is somebody, is, is there duplication of software that we ought to get rid of? Or is there duplication of software, two different pieces of software that do roughly the same thing, but we need both of them because this is how people design, because whatever reasons are there, back to the culture of the company, know what's happening with all those things. I've got in here bolded out learning resources because uh, that's one of the more, I would say, common things that we would see people in that role of BIM manager take on is making sure your lunch and learn sessions or the little internal webinars, uh, tips and tricks notes. Uh, one of our customers, I believe, calls it job aids, a little step-by-step -step instructions on how to get this type of thing done and sharing that information so that everybody knows how to best utilize what's going on inside the software. Do you have the tools for that? Do you have the tools to help deploy and manage all that type of company software and all those things that are going on? Uh, what's happening with those items so that you can best leverage those tools and resources? And it might be something that is at the core of your business, like we'll say a Revit or a Civil 3D. It might be something that's a supplemental tool. What resources do you have to help out the rest of your company, the rest of the team, your colleagues that you work with get moving in that. Now, as, as an example of some of the things that can come through, there's going to be some obvious plugs in here from time to time. I mean, come on, it's a webcast. Um, imagine it's got our solution called Productivity Now. And I would say that it's very um, aggressively priced out for different things, but if your company culture is one that can take advantage of self-paced online e-learning, then there's some really wicked cool tools out there. A ton of different software products, Autodesk and non-Autodesk non related, that are available on this platform. Um, How-to videos plus printed material. Um, our sister company, Ascent, who creates, uh, likely if you ever took a class on, we'll say Revit or AutoCAD or Inventor or Civil 3D or, 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 is likely driven by a book that was written by Ascent. Uh, we've got all of that material plus these uh, e-learning videos, uh, tips and tricks, uh, all sorts of different things that are just built into a, a very easy to use searchable thing so that those people that can learn in this fashion can just grab something and run. I forgot how to do stairs. Great. Do a search for stairs. Check out those pieces and parts. Great. Let's go. Or I've got something going on with, uh, crap, how do you do cut and fill with site work in Revit? It's been two years since I did it last, and I've got to make sure I do it right. Have something available, whether it's your own internal intellectual property IP that you put together for your staff to use, if you're leveraging something like Productivity Now or whatever other resources are out there. Uh, have something available for, for yourself and your team to be able to go through those and process of learning what's new, what's happening, what's happening with this other piece of software. We've done a lot of rendering in Revit. We want to take it to the next level. How do we best learn 3D Studio Max? It's part of our AEC collection. Let's figure out how to use it because, yeah, why not? It's there. There's a lot of different types of things that we can pull together. Make sure you've got that sitting out there. And that helps a lot, uh, help, heh, helps out a lot with the idea of uh, helping to manage that software side of your environment by having all those different tools, the things that I mentioned on that previous checklist over here of, you know, when you're looking at software, existing or new software, does it improve your staff capability? Does it do this? Does it have learning resources? Do all those things. That's a good way to 
look at and evaluate software. And it also tends to be a really nice bridge between saying, well, how do I help manage software and then the people? Because I can have all the best tools in the world out there, and if nobody's going to actually use it, well, that doesn't do me any good. So getting beyond the idea of software management, the idea of learning resources also becomes that bridge between software management and people management. That idea of people management might be something similar to you know, a direct report or, or somebody that you have direct influence or quote unquote control over, uh, but it could also be a place where you know, yeah, there's entirely too many places where if you've got the role of a, a BIM manager or equivalent title that you have responsibility to get things done, but no authority to make sure it gets done. You have to beg, borrow, and plead to get resources and people to help you get things done. That's entirely possible and likely where you are. And so as we're looking at this from a people management side, there's going to be that blend between where can I influence, where can I do things to uh, directly because I've got that power and authority, and where do we need to leverage, you know, interpersonal relationships, things like that, to, to get things done. Because, yeah, as it says, leadership and learning are there. People are messy. Um, it's just a piece we've got to be able to get through. And as people are messy, crazy things will happen. How do we get past it? How do we get we beyond the funky things that go on? Hopefully, as we're running into issues, we'll find places where a problem happens, but then after the problem happens, Maybe we'll be able to turn around and say, well, let's just make sure we don't do that again. And if you never make the same mistake twice, I'll say that's a net positive all in all. And as I've been in this role that I am now, uh, working in, with and in, in leading the team of people that I, I have today, I can't say that I'm perfect, not by any stretch in the imagination. But things that I've come across over the years is I've been working in a managerial team leader role or, or whatever types of things you want to call it, both within Imagine It and outside, things that, that resonated with me, think, th thoughts I've collected over the years. I'm not going to read every single one of these on the side. You've probably almost even finished reading them on your own by now. But the, the items that I would say are, are very important to this is really those soft skills, those people skills. Uh, compassion and empathy. Uh, and then, as uh, many who know me would say, that there's there's got to be a fine balance between that idea of compassion and empathy, but then also holding people accountable. Uh, you can't let yourself get run over. And, and depending on your personality type, that might be a really difficult thing. Many of us, many, not all, and you, you'll know yourself hopefully pretty well to understand where you fit, but many of us are in this role because we like knowing the answer. We like being able to help people and get some of that, that praise or whatever that comes out from saying, I've got your answer. I can be your hero. And that can be addictive to some reason. That might be overstating it. But it can be it, – it's, it's a good feeling, it's a, and it's an endorphin rush, right? As we're doing that, though, we've got to be able to back out and, and – think logically through here of if we're just that person that everybody comes to all the time, then you're limiting the ability for growth as, as far as your BIM implementation, the BIM capabilities of the firm, because you become this bottleneck. And that's not a happy thing. It's not a good thing. Uh, I've, I've been that bottleneck, and my managers have gently but firmly come down from time to time and say, hey, you know what, you're the problem here. I'm not saying those words, but you know, that's essentially what is coming through. You're the bottleneck. We need, to, we need to be able to say no so that you've got some extra bandwidth to get things done. We need to be able to delegate better so that things can get done. So that it's got to be that mix between compassion, empathy, helping people, and having that desire to make people better with holding people accountable, being firm where you need to. It's, it's a very crazy, delicate balance. You'll find your, your best spot for that. But my personal side is that when, we, when we've got that balance, I will fall on the side of compassion and empathy over holding things strict. 
personal side. And that helps out, though, when you need to come back and ask for something. Related to that as well, the, the whole thing for the find your why. Um, I mentioned this one on one of the previous BIM management pieces as well. But if you know why you're doing something, a lot of other things will just help, you know, they'll fall into place. If your team knows why they are doing something, your team directly or indirectly, the, the people that you work with in your company, you're trying to roll out a new BIM standard and you're trying to get people to follow it, but you have no control. It's really the project architect, the project engineer that has the authority and control over what's happening on the project. You can't tell them you can't do it that way. You, you've got to be able to figure out the other ways around it. So if, if we can get the why and people can understand the why are we doing this, why are we following this standard, why, that helps out with a great amount of the resistance to proceeding forward with it. Uh, there are places where we've had people working on projects where if they're not aware of the big picture of what is happening as an overall initiative for the company, they're not as engaged with that particular task at hand because it's, well, it's, just a, it's just a class or it's just a couple pieces of content, whatever. But once there's the idea and, and where, your, where your spot is in that bigger picture, how what you're doing makes a difference for why we're doing what we're doing, it has a lot of benefit to bringing people on board to where you're coming and where you're going. So those will be the biggest things that I'll say for, for people management. If you know what types of software and the technological end, uh, the process and technology that you've got going through there, and you've got a nice handle on your, the people end of things, then we get to turn around and say, well, as a BIM manager, not just as a, a generic, generic human being sitting on planet Earth, rotating, whatever, as a, as a BIM manager, where are there places that you can make a positive impact? So if we're looking at that, places that, you know, I would say, as a BIM manager, you can make a positive, or heck, if you do it wrong, the negative impact on your company really comes down to these seven things. You could probably come up with your own list of something that's similar, different, or whatever, but these, these tended to, to fit for me as I was thinking about all the different things that are out there. Absolutely, almost always number one needs to be thinking about you can have an impact on strategy, vision, and innovation within the company. If you're involved with managing that, that BIM environment in your company, that is absolutely core center for what you can be doing. I would say also what you ought to be doing. And largely, you could probably say that everything else after that is some sort of thing that is derived from strategy, vision, and innovation inside the company. From that, we will need to define standards versus guidelines. You know, how strict do you need to be versus how generalized can you be? Standards versus guidelines. You will be able to absolutely make an impact from people on education. How are you going to impart knowledge on the rest of your team? Is it going to be one of those uh, self-paced learning things? Is it a lunch and learn session? Is it a half-day seminar? Is it a multi-day class? All those things are possible. How can you take what you've got and the, the team that you might have that you can work with to further educate the rest of your colleagues inside the company. The, the other three, five, six, and seven, get a little bit more fuzzy as far as you can say, well, you know, how can some of these things happen? What types of things can I influence? You know, how can I influence the prestige of the company? Well, if as a BIM manager, you're finding different ways to use technology in maybe innovative ways, if we go back to number one, or you know, innovations, uh, it's, it's a buzzword that sometimes I think loses its, its meaning in places because everybody wants to be innovative. Well, how are you innovative? Well, we do special things with microclimates when we're setting up our, our buildings. Uh, is that really innovative? Or yeah, I don't know. So it, it can get overused in places. So if we're not talking about innovation, you know, how are you better leveraging technology in cool ways to get things done? You know, are you guys doing much with Dynamo? If you think about the general prestige, if you've got two equal firms, but one of them's got a few people that are playing around and working with Dynamo and the other doesn't, is there a, you know, there might be a little core thing that says, well, the guys that are doing stuff with Dynamo, they're a little bit more bleeding edge than the others because they're doing something in this other place. Uh, so some things like that where if you can set up the, 
the image of your firm and what you're doing within the firm to say we're we're using Revit as more than just a model of a building so we can create construction documents. We are actually doing something with energy analysis. We're actually doing something with uh, construction planning. We're actually doing things with blending this building into a facility management system. That that has an impact on prestige. It has an impact on how productive people can be. Uh, there was a, a study that I read, it was a while back now, but it was saying of the people that fully engaged in the BIM process, which you can translate for this study as being they fully engaged with the idea of using Revit. People that felt that they were all in to BIM also felt that they got a large return on investment and in productivity enhancements increases based off of what they accomplished. The people that were just kind of dipping their toe in did not see the same level of productivity enhancements, which makes sense. If you're not going to really dig into the tool, you're not going to get as much out of it. So those are the places where we can have some direct impact. And as we're doing those things, focusing in for a moment on strategy and vision, uh, just to make sure we understand the, the difference between those things, the strategy of vision and tactics are the, the things that make up what we can do day in, day out as we're working in as the manager. The vision is why are we doing things. Again, that why is, is critically important. If, if you don't know why you're doing something, stop for a minute and figure it out because if there's no good reason – Maybe you ought to be doing something else instead. Uh, hopefully that's not some sort of life-changing statement of, crap, I need to change my career. But hopefully it's something more along the lines of, uh, why are we doing walls this way? Why are we setting up projects this way? Why are we doing analysis this way? Why I Get some of that. Get those answers. And then the strategy is, well, okay, well, now that I why I'm doing things, what tactical items are I going to take action on to make all this work? What am I going to do, and how am I going to accomplish it? So if, you know, going through the table here, the, the idea of the definition, perspective, time example, the very first uh, presentation we had on BIM management goes deeper into these types of things, but it's really the, the idea of the strategy is how are we going to use Revit to improve our business? We're going to do X, Y, and Z to become more productive, to leverage the model in better ways to increase our prestige, hopefully win more projects, and if nothing else, have a better building at the end of the day. Now, how are we going to do it? How are we going to do it? Uh, what are we going to do to make it? Well, we're going to create families. How are we going to create families? We're going to create families that are based off of this particular set of standards to make sure that all of the things that we want to accomplish in the model can be done because the content is in alignment with the strategy and the vision. So some different things like that that we can take in and run through. And Taking that then, we had where, what can we make an impact on? You know, strategy, vision, standards, education, content, employee satisfaction, staff retention, productivity, profitability, prestige. How are we going to do it? The vision, the tactics, the strategy of all those things. Well, where can you make an impact? It's like I can have this great vision of what I can do with my company, but if I don't have any ability to impact that part of the business, you know, where, where's, the, where's the benefit in that? So one of the things you've got to take in next is to understand what are your spheres of influence. And they're going to change for everybody that's out there. And so be thinking about things for a little bit. I mean, on the, on the obvious side, you know, I want to make a big impact on my company as Imagine It. And based off of that, we need to do a complete hierarchical change of everything that, okay, I can't do that. That's not going to happen. That falls into the everything red area of nothing I can have an impact on. Uh, okay. I, I can be fine with that. But if I'm thinking about where can, where can I have control, where can I directly influence people, where is there some of that indirect influence? I, I don't have any easy way for you to be able to say uh, this, is, this is how you make those determinations other than be thinking of if you say, if you were to talk to somebody inside your company and say, I need you to do this, do they do it? That's probably a place where you've got some level, I mean, complete control. I, I wanted to throw maybe like a, a little joker face or something that says, ha, 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 ha. You know, nobody has complete control over anything except for maybe yourself. Um, but if you can say that, then you've got some level of control. If you're talking to somebody in the company and say, could you please – and, and it's not just the being nice of, you know, could you please do this instead of saying you will do this, but, you know, saying can you please do this for me as a favor or something along those lines. 
that's probably more somebody that you have a direct influence on. Um, so as, as an example, when I was looking at things in very broad types of things when you're we're looking at a project, you might have complete control over your direct team. I've got complete control over my building lifecycle solutions team. Cool. Um, direct influence. I have some direct influence, we'll say, on, on the, the sales portion of my team, on the marketing portion of my team. I have direct influence. I can't tell them what to do and in a lot of places, nor should I. But I have some direct influence over that uh, in, a, in a design, architecture, engineering, construction, whatever firm that maybe is the rest of your company that's outside of your direct team. Uh, the project partners piece was where you have indirect influence. If you're the architect and you've got a you know, MEP engineer that's got a sub, you probably have some indirect influence on that sub through the direct influence that you might have on the MEP firm. So taking a look at these degrees of separation of where do you have that influence? If you're thinking about BIM, you probably have you know, direct influence on the immediate people that you, you manage if you've got a team that you manage. Uh, you probably have direct influence on standards. You might have a, uh, well, control over standards perhaps, depending on how your company is set up. You might have direct influence on people complying with those standards. You might have indirect influence on somebody outside of your company following your standards so that when they turn in something to you, it actually works. Uh, there's a bunch of different places through that, but just be thinking about how do you engage with different people, with different things day to day. And as we're doing that, know that when you're looking at this from your sphere of influence, probably you want to be focusing on the things that are closer to the core, closer to that what you have that complete control than the next, next level of importance on where you have direct influence, and then much less on indirect. And it may be difficult, but try to do what you can to get to be at peace with all the things that you cannot impact. There's all sorts of, you know, meme phrases or things that might be out there of how you might be able to deal with the things that you have no control over, funny and, and solemn. But try to make sure that as you're looking at your vision, your tactics, your strategy, that they are related to things that you can't have that positive impact on. Be thinking of that influence. And hierarchically organize it. Because if we can get some level of organization in here, then we can have uh, intentional activity that has the best positive, largest positive impact possible for you and your company. So on the imaginative side, when we're looking at working on a, a project with somebody, we'll go through what we'll call the take aim process. It's our uh, branding for how we go about a, a, a services project, an implementation of new technology or whatever. And it falls down into four major phases. Um, amazingly enough, all of us coming out of the building design world, you got traditionally four major phases in a building construction project, you know, going from schematics or conceptual design to design development, construction documents, and construction administration. We took that same type of thing and said, great, we got four phases for a project. And if we're taking that thing, we've got a vision of why am I doing something, I've looked at spheres, spheres of influence, and it falls into something that is either direct control or direct influence. So great, now what am I gonna change? Why do I wanna change something? I've, I've got these things, let's start defining what's happening. And again, screenshot this or do whatever just to get an idea of what types of things might go into that, that initial definition phase. It's like the, the conceptual design of a building of overall, what's this thing look like? What are we going to do? What's the difference between designing a house and a hospital? It, there's different things that need to go into it. If you're going to go through and make a change, what will be better because of that change? As it says there, how are you gonna enact the change? How are you going to go about doing those things? Once you've got those pieces and understanding that aspect of your environment, start taking things, put it into a list. I mean, we do punch lists all the time in building design, do the same type of thing here. If you've got that idea and you start to move into this development end, specifically what will be done? So if, if you're going to be making a change to X, Y, and Z, and based off of that, it means that you're going to have to update some Revit content libraries. I'm just pulling something out of nowhere. Okay, so update the Revit content libraries. Okay, great. Now, how many families? Specifically, which families? And what are you doing to them? Are you injecting a new parameter? Are you changing a parameter value? Uh, are you, what are you doing to that? And add it up. 
figure out exactly what it needs to be. There's a customer of ours that was saying, hey, we need to update our content library. And there, well, there's a bunch of customers that come to us with those types of things. But uh, we were looking at it saying, okay, well, how much? He said, geez, that's a great question. Uh, we've just got all of our stuff here and it's not really all that organized. Okay, well, step one is let's get all that stuff together. So we went through and you know, pushed all the, the Revit family files to a spreadsheet. So we have a list of names and it's like, okay, now we've seen that we have 600 and some odd families inside your library. And doing a little bit digger, deeping and, and diving through that, if we've got you know, 600 families and updating it for whatever we need to do is going to take five minutes per family, which is not a whole lot of time, but five minutes per family times 600 families, that is suddenly a very large project. And there have been many times when we go through this process and it causes people to step back and say, whoa, this is, I thought it was just a simple thing, but this is a bigger deal than I thought it was going to be. It's not to say that we don't go through whatever that, that set of actions is because the vision of why we're doing it could be good and, and big enough to know we have to do this thing. But it lets you step back and say, you know, we've been developing, you know, we were developing CAD standards for decades. And then when we change to Revit, it's like, wow, there's a lot of work in getting this thing set up. Well, yeah, you're taking what you had set up over the course of decades and saying, let's swap over to a, a Revit world in the matter of weeks, months, whatever. And we're cramming all that work into a much shorter period of time. So, yeah, it's a big deal. And we're going from saying from a facility side, we were doing everything with CAD and now we're moving to a BIM thing, but we've got buildings we've had on our campus for tens or hundreds of years and we've got a bunch of paper, PDF or whatever documents and we want to go to a model. Great. Well, you've got 1.2 million square feet that needs to be set up in a Revit model. That's a lot of work. Gee, maybe we ought to phase this out over a longer period of time. Some of these are really simple types of things, but it's, it's breaking it down into those component parts, figuring specifically what will it done, how long will it take, and doing the math to figure out who's going to do it and you know, make sure they are committed to it is a really, really important thing to make sure it does get done. Make sure you've got that real effort set aside there. Maybe it's just you. Maybe this is what I'm going to do, and I know I'm the only one that can do it or should be able to do it because everybody else is busy doing something else. I know it's going to be you know, 30 hours worth of work unless I can get some automation in there, and I only have two hours a week to get this done. So I need to set the expectation to the higher-ups in the company that it's going to be a few weeks before this gets done because of the amount of time we can put to it. Some of this is, is no-brainer stuff, but if we take it into the context of the planning and the development and setting up the, the, the vision, tactics, and strategy of what you're doing, you get a lot better buy-in for what's happening and why it's going, or maybe get buy-in on increasing the resources available to you for that. And specifically, when we're talking about yourself, take some time now and then. Maybe it's during a session like this one, but think about things for yourself. Where are you with all this? How much work is on your list? How much time do you have to get it done? Can you do it? Uh, there's a place where I was actually helping to put together a scope of work for one of the people on my team, and I got you know, partway through this, and I couldn't fill out, I couldn't create part of that scope of work. I did not have the technical knowledge needed to do it. So instead, what I ended up doing is I wrote a whole bunch of questions of, hey, for this part of the scope of work, we need to answer this, 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 and this, and got it over to the person that does have the knowledge to be able to answer those questions and do it. I, I gave the guidance of what we needed to have, but I've got to leverage somebody else because I didn't have the knowledge or, honestly, the time to get that type of stuff done. Yeah, how many hours a week are you putting? Are you being honest with your time cards? That's something I've starting to harp on my team quite a bit more lately is are, are you just putting 40 hours in because you're 40 hours or are you really working 45? Are you really working 50 but you're only putting 40 because you, you don't want to draw attention or whatever your reasons are? We need these things to be, to be real, to be legit because if we're going to use data to drive our decisions, then I need to have the real data. If, if I've got somebody on my team that's getting burnt out um, but I, all I see are just the, the green flags and happy smileys everywhere because they're, they're hiding or masking things from me, 
It doesn't do me any good. It doesn't do them any good either. It doesn't allow us to take those corrective actions. And all of those actions, all the things that you do accomplish over time need to be those, those SMART goals. And the SMART types of goals that we're talking about is that specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. Uh, that has been around for years and years and years of, of creating SMART objectives. Uh, if you cannot measure it, why do it? Well, there might be some really good reasons to do it, but if you cannot measure it, you're not going to be easily able to turn around to the people that you report to and say, this was awesome and here's why. It might have been a specific task. It might have been achievable. Well, you, you got it done. It was relevant to something. It was you know, time-bound. We got it done within the right amount of time. But if I can't measure the before and after, did I have the impact? You know, I, I can't do that. If I can measure it, then absolutely do what you can. If, if you're trying to make a change, and by making this change, we'll reduce the number of uh, cycles of redlining that we go through on a project. Well, you might have something that says, well, we don't have any way of measuring how many cycles of redlinings we did before because we never did measure it previously. Well, start measuring it now. And as you start implementing whatever this change is, see how that, that thing that you're measuring trends. Does it stay flat? Does it go up? Does it go down? Where is it going on that? And if you're not having the intended impact, step back and think, well, why? Is it because people aren't doing it right? That might be something, but... I'll tend to, to personally take the the mindset of if something's not having the impact that I thought it was going to have, the first thing I'll want to do is turn it back into myself, turn, turn introspective on this and say, well, did I do something wrong? Is there something that I didn't put into that implementation that didn't take into account something that's happening in the practical reality of business that I didn't think about? Is, it, is there a possibility that somebody else I'm working with actually has a better idea or good influence or something that they can provide as input back to me of, oh, that's why, and let's go ahead and take this next thing. Don't assume that what you implemented was going to be perfect from the beginning. You know, we're all human. We're all failing in some level or another. So that'll be, that'll be my side. That may not be yours, but again, I'm the one talking, so you get to hear what I'm going to say. But why or why not? And, and so maybe it's something that you can do to change how you implemented something and, and tweak what was going on. Uh, maybe it is how you rolled it out so people weren't doing it the right way, and that's legitimately they, – they just weren't doing it right. So we need to help retrain people and, and get it going the better way. They didn't know the why part of it, so they didn't care enough to try and follow through, possibly. But we take all those things and say, now what? Let's, let's just get into that feedback loop. And make sure it's not just an internal feedback loop. You're getting feedback from all sorts of people around you to make sure that we've got it and we're going better. Um, as an example, plenty of people do checks from time to time on their Revit files to see, are we doing things the right way? Are we using the right settings? Are we using the company-approved content libraries? All sorts of different things that you might look at. In the Imagine It side, we'll call it a, a Revit health check. Or we've got this other piece of software called Clarity that will check for different performance indicators on a Revit file and give you dashboards to see how things are going in there. Are they trending in positive or negative ways? All sorts of different fun things. But as we're going through that, whether you're, you're checking things manually or you've got a tool to do those things, be, be self-critical and, and open to feedback from different areas. Uh, just because somebody did something in a very creative way inside your software of choice. Is it necessarily bad? Maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, but understand the context of what's happening with there so that when you get to that now what, we can say, according to the things that we said we're going to measure, here's why we're measuring it, here's what we're measuring, here's how we're measuring it. And off of, out of all those things, this is what we're seeing. Make sure people know the context for all that so that when we come back to them and say, hey, your project had uh, 1,500 room separation lines. That doesn't seem quite right. Let's talk about why and, and build your way into that and understand that this was a, a, you know, a red flag on our review of the project files. Let's get it so that we get to green flags. If need be, do what you can to provide both the carrot and the stick for in, inducing change in people. 
but we need to be able to understand how do we evaluate and then you know get those things a little bit of documentation not to be able to turn something to bludgeon over somebody else's head but to understand how that's coming out and once you have that so we've we've come back we said i've got my my what i'm doing how i'm doing it why i'm doing it i set up some goals that were smart they were specific measurable achievable relevant and time bound for why i'm doing whatever change or whatever thing is there it's going to cost us some money either hard cash coming out because we have to invest in hardware, software, whatever, to make the change, or there's going to be a soft cost because there's a learning curve that people need to pay attention to, whatever. There's, there's some level of investment into the solution that we'll have, and then there's an intended benefit that comes out of it. And we can calculate that. Uh, to go into that idea of the return on investment calculation. Let's make sure that whatever we do has a positive thing coming on the outside end of it. So uh, example of a return on investment calculation, this is kind of the extreme end of things, but um, I'd mentioned we have that clarity piece of software from Imagine It. Uh, often you'll see the return on investment type of calculations referred to as a straight up dollar figure, uh, sometimes a percentage, uh, and other times a, a time. You know, how long did it take for us to re recoup our investment? Uh, so all those things kind of come into place. And sometimes it's just, this is the cost of doing business. So there's no real return on investment other than we stayed in business, which is a really good return on investment. But there's this clarity software it can cost you, you know, we'll say eight grand a year. And if you fall into the average or above average utilization of the clarity software, 280 hours per project per year, we have at any given point in time, five decent sized projects going on inside our office. We have a internal billing rate or HR overhead rate of 75 bucks per hour, do that math. 280 hours, five projects, $105,000 annually in things that this Clarity software could do for you. Um, and it costs eight grand. Now, that being said, there, I can pull out all the wonderful things. ROI calculations are that great fuzzy math. It's like statistics. You can make them lie in just about any way you wanted to. I'll back these numbers up. And I will personally fully believe in all of them. But if we're looking at all that, you could say, well, the ROI of this, if we go through and take whatever thing you're thinking of, this is one example. There's hundreds, millions of them out there. Take whatever you might be looking to do and say, here's the cost. Here is the, the benefit that we expect to get on the end of it. And so our projected return on investment is, you know, we'll break even, we'll make back the investment we had in it after X number of days we will have a something percent ROI over you know, whatever period of time you're looking at. We will be able to bring in an extra X dollars of revenue to the company by doing this. A few different ways. If you're doing the percent side of things, you end up taking the, uh, the, the cost, sorry, take the, the benefit, the, the value that you're getting out of the solution minus the cost so in this case, we'd take uh, $105,000 minus $8,000 uh, and divide it by the cost. So 105 minus 8 divided by 8 gives us the 1,212% ROI in one year. So you can do all those different things. And especially if you're talking to somebody like a CFO, this type of information will tend to resonate fairly well with them because you've got facts and numbers and figures to back it up. It's not just, this is a cool tool. I want to do it. Um, because, you know, we, why, why did you go to BIM in the first place? There are customers that came to us and said, we, we need to go to Revit because everybody else is. Okay, I get it. It's a reason. At least you have something in mind, but that's not a great reason. Uh, maybe the real reason, if once you really dig into it behind the scenes, is we're losing work, and we need to go to Revit because all of our competitors are, and they're promoting this whole BIM thing, and we're falling behind and we need to catch back up. Okay, that's a better reason. It's, a, it's thinking a little bit more than the superficial, easy answers. And then we can start backing up those decisions to say, hey, if we go this route, we'll be able to do X, Y, and Z. Other types of things we can get out of these ROI calculations, all sorts of places where it can fit in. But we can use it to, you know, if you're, especially if you're talking to those higher level people inside the company, can help reinforce your overall competency to your colleagues, to your senior management provide the value, prove out the differentiation between what you're looking to do versus where you are right now. Uh, it has, has the ability to, to reflect better on you as a person 
and then also can just bolster your argument of why I want to do this. You know, I want to do this because it improves our business. Uh, Mr. And Mrs. Owner, senior partner, whomever you are, you told me that our goal for this company, we have a strategic goal to achieve X, Y, and Z. If we do these things, they move us down that path to achieving those goals, and here's the return on investment that we've got that is a part of your strategic vision for the company. That has a lot better of an impact of, yeah, we, you know, we had a customer that said we needed to do a CFD calculation for this data center. Okay, either way, maybe it gets done, but one of them has a lot better impact than the other. And as we're looking at that, you know, as we say here, not everything can be measured. Some of these things are really soft. They're really fuzzy. You know, how, how can we go about that? Well, do your best. Try to measure what you can. And if you can't, you know, get some of the ancillary things so that you can – maybe sometimes the, the, what you can measure is overall, we said a while back, employee satisfaction is something we can have an influence on. So maybe I can't measure dollars in what this impact has, but if I can talk to people of you know, how satisfied are you with the BIM environment of our company today and then six months later ask the same question – was there a change? Is there a market improvement? Did you improve employee satisfaction? Which then you go to your manager and said, hey, guess what? I improved employee satisfaction. We're going to have better retainment. Give me a raise. I, who knows if you'll be successful with that, but yeah, there's something you can back it up with because you've got, you got hard facts, hard figures to be able to pull that through. And I'll say with all of those things, no matter where we're at with all this, whether we're, we're setting up the goals, we're trying to figure out the tactics, the reasons why or whatever else is through there, Leverage us. Leverage Imagine it for that. We do these types of things for ourselves internally. We do these types of things for our customers. Uh, we can help and you know, fill that gap to get between that spot of where you are and making that positive impact, hitting that success point on, on where we are to be able to measure it. And some of those places where you, you might have that title of BIM manager, um, there's a number of handful of companies that we're working with where they've recently lost their BIM manager for one reason or another and just need some help for a little bit of a bridge until they get somebody hired on again. So it's, it's either supplementing where we're the BIM management augmentation, if you want to call it that, because uh, you're just so darn stinking busy. And it helps to get another, another set of hands helping out with things or another voice at the table providing some input from outside of your organization, some you know, additional ways of viewing at things or other best practices that we might be aware of. Different things that can happen. When we're looking at it from a BIM management side, uh, it's, it's a lot of where we're going with helping our customers because a lot of people out there are using Revit. And we don't need to get any training. That's fine. But we've got some, some more strategic things that we do need to figure out. How can we be utilize, How can we be utilizing this tool better than we have? And, you know, short of production work, you don't want to pay somebody, a consultant, to, to do production work. Let's, let's figure out how we, our existing staff can be more effective. Let's help out with that planning. Um, take a look at what you've got and just a quick review and say, hey, from an outside perspective, does this look good? Uh, we, we do need some help. We've, there's a few different places where we're helping out from a – say, a model management, BIM management level on a project for a specific project. It's separate from the rest of corporate objectives, but we're just getting this team. Again, not doing the design for you. We're not setting up your construction documents for you. We're, not, we're working to try and make sure you've got the best possible environment for yourself, for your teams to, to go there and thrive. And if you're the guy and you're thinking, yeah, th this is all sounds good, there's some great – tips and things for me to remember, to be thinking about, whatever. I don't need Imagine It's help right now. Look, keep a list of these types of things. Are you doing all these things as a BIM manager? Are you setting up and working with project execution plans per project? Are you constantly going through doing all these things? If you are, kudos to you, man, or woman. It's, it's a good place to be. That's, that's awesome. Two thumbs up. Keep going, fighting the good fight. Do you need help through there? There's Places where, again, as Imagine It, when we're helping customers as a BIM manager, most of the time our idea is we want to work ourselves out of a job. We want to make sure that we get you to a place where you're good and you don't need us anymore. You might choose to have us hang around for a little bit longer and, and help out with things as, as, a, 
know, a regular touch point going forward, but that becomes your business decision. We want to make sure that we are in whatever way. Maybe it is training. Maybe it is BIM management assistance. Maybe it is a health check. Maybe it is getting some software automation in place because you've got 500 Revit families to inject a parameter into, and you've got one weekend to get it done. Who knows what types of things you've got, but the whole idea that I've got, the whole intent behind all this is to make sure we're thinking about things correctly from a BIM management standpoint. But then as we come back and roll it into to all the different tools and resources that you've got available, don't forget that we're here for you. Don't forget that from an imaginative side, we want to make sure that you're successful, that the, the investment you've got in software, the investment you've got in people is being utilized as efficiently, as effectively, as productively as it can. So I'll say thank you very much, everybody, for your time here, and we'll head our way into the, the questions that have been coming through.